Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everyone. It's really good to be with you this morning, but I must say, I feel as if we have been together the whole weekend because I'm seeing you all yesterday. And can we give a huge round of applause to everything that went into yesterday? And it was such a very special day, and we are so privileged to share in the crafts and to celebrate the gifts in our congregation and to have the ministry to children the way it was yesterday was really spectacular. And I've been down at the patch, and the work that people are doing at the patch is phenomenal. Friends, it's great to have you with us today. I'm really privileged to welcome Tim Smiley and Candy again. Let me tell you... I sent Tim an email at 6.30 this morning, not sure whether he would get the email or not, said, hey Tim, we had a sudden thought this week that it would be good to put on pink on Sunday in honor of Breast Cancer Month, and they came, kid it out, so thank you so much. It was a bit harder for me to find pink, but this is as pink as it gets, and, so, and as bright as I could possibly find. So friends, um, and of course, my sister's in town for the fall festival, so Leslie's here, which is great. Why don't we just stand up, and I am so happy that our team that were on the many travels have returned. So Lisa's going to lead us in a minute, but friends, let's stand up and bless one another with the peace. Let's pass the peace. It's like herding cats, I know. Holy chaos, I love it. This is my favorite part of church on Sundays. So I wanted to thank you all for your prayers. You can see we're back mostly in one piece. Um, I have a little cold, so if I don't hug you, don't take it personally. I just don't want to breathe on you. Um, we really did covet your prayers. Our, our trip got changed, but it was amazing. And um, everything we did was just truly wonderful. We were literally hours from being docked in Israel when the chaos struck. And the cruise company was amazing and redirected us so quickly. Um, we ended up more following Paul's footsteps than Jesus's, but amen to that, right? Um, you can't really complain about being in Greece in the middle of the, the fall, right? Um, so again, I, we want to, I, I think I speak for all of us, we want to thank you for your prayers. It really did mean something to us that you were all there with us in prayer, so thank you. And if you'll stand for our call to worship this morning. That is not the call to worship I have up here. <laughs> is there a different one up there, or are we going with this? We're going to go with this. <laughs> Holy chaos, as usual. Oh, Nick, you're killing me, man. <laughs> Come, now is the time to worship. We worship God who us. When the Israelites worshipped the golden calf, 
God listened to Moses and chose to correct instead of destroy. God persistently invites us to return to God. Jesus tells a story of a wedding banquet where the guests dismissed the invitation and harmed the messengers. So the king invited people off the streets and welcomed all who received the invitation in earnest. God persistently invites us to return to God. Too often we turn from God's ways, choosing our stiff-necked insistence that we know what is best. I don't do that. How about you? <laughs> Instead of trusting God's provision, love, and guidance, when we turn away and our love fails, God continues to offer us opportunities to return to God and join in the celebration of God's abundant love and life. Come, now is the time to worship. Amen? Amen. We come to worship God, who keeps inviting us for the long haul. Amen. Amen. The worship team is going to come up and regale us with song. So please remain standing. Try this again. Oh, there it is. Let's bless the Lord this morning. Here we go. Two, three, sing it. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the stream
because you see that we're a little discombobulated this morning, or maybe it's just me. But one of the things I've always loved this church is we allow space for that, right? We're still worshipful, we're still appreciative, and so thank you. I'm going to ask Tim to come up and do the children's moment for us. So this is Team Tim this morning. Tim Smiley preaching, Tim Smiley children's moment. <laughs> Team Tim. Come on, Sebastian. Come, come on. Okay. Anyone that wants to, anyone that wants to be a kid can come. Okay. So today is a good day for me because I got my first ever allowance from my dad. Thank you. <laughs> so it's a bunch of coins, right? So where does money come from? Trees. Oh, okay, so the bank trees. So from a factory. Okay, we don't do counterfeit money. So I was looking at my coins and I realized these might be mine now, but if I go to the store and I give them to the store, they're now the stores. If I go and give them to the patch, they're now the pumpkin patches. I can go and give them to the craft ladies. So, and one thing I realized is they have different faces on them, right? I feel like we all like Benjamins. So I looked at my bag of coins. I'm looking around the church, right? And I see all these different faces. So people can create the money in their image, but we're all created in God's image, right? So with the money, there's a... Yes. Yes, correct. God makes different people. So with today's story... There are these Pharisees, and they want to trick Jesus. So they give him a trick question and say, should we pay taxes to go to church? Or pay taxes, right? And they expect him to give an answer, right? But Yes. It, so it should be free. So, so, but back then, it wasn't free. So they tax people. So they asked Jesus, should people pay taxes? And they expected Jesus to give one answer. And Jesus said, give to God what is God's. Plain and simple. Period. I know what that means. That, that God, uh, that, God, that basically when you go to church, you're giving God his, you're giving God your respect for him. So you shouldn't pay money to respect God. Uh, yes. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to pray and then we're going to go to Sunday school. <laughs> we're going to have fun. Leo, you want to pray? You, you don't want to pray? Everything that you that you've answered us for, and everything that you will give us soon. Hopefully, we will get everything that we need and something that we want. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship through song?
Tim, you're going to have a great day, trust me. <laughs> Worthy of every song you could ever see. Thank you. 
as we come to God in prayer, let us pray. Almighty God, you are the author of life and we are in awe of your creation. The vast oceans reflect your majesty and the ever-changing skies renew our lands. The deep valleys carry your peace and your shelter. You are Savior of the world, and we are amazed at your grace. The nations find peace in your forgiveness. The sufferer finds hope in your healing hands. The burden finds rest in your promise of heaven. We think of the suffering around us, God. We hold nations in conflict and people in crisis. And we pray for your healing, loving presence. Your unconditional love. And we are privileged to be filled by your presence. The youth are filled with your vision. And we heard it this morning. The old are filled with your wisdom, and we have seen it today. The oppressed are unchanged, unchained by your freedom. Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, we praise and worship you this morning. And we say together the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite the stewards now to wait upon us for our offering to the work of God. And at this time, we also acknowledge the, the money that we have received in many different ways throughout this week. Just as we receive the offering, I do have a couple of notices that I'd like to speak to you about, just some announcements. First of all, to say thank you so much I believe that we've received in 71 people have either filled in this form that we handed out last week where you gave us some input as to what service times you would prefer, what um, traditional and contemporary, and some great feedback was given. We have been able to generate a code that you will be able to use a Google form and fill in um, if you've not already filled in information. And if you would still prefer to use the paper version, we do have a couple of copies. We would like to know, just get some feedback. There are two reasons. One, to get feedback around what you would prefer in terms of our two services going forward. Forward. And secondly, how you are able to serve in the different services. So please fill that in. Um, we'll be able to give you some feedback next week. We'll print the details in the bulletin. It'll just give us an extra week so that we really, really would appreciate your feedback. So thank you so much. 
for that. And then just a couple of other things. Please go through the bulletin. There's so much happening in the life of our church. We are beginning to conclude our month of stewardship. And so in the next couple of weeks, we'll be inviting you after your prayer and time of real reflection to a giving and a stewardship for 2024 in the life of the church. Please look out for that information. And then next week, we have the incredible privilege of celebrating our first fruits which is going to be amazing. So there is a a meeting after the service. We look forward to that next Sunday. And so please, those that are involved in that meeting, please stay behind for a meeting that we can make final preparations for that. And you don't want to miss the pumpkin patch. No, no, no. Pumpkin patch, definitely, and the trunk or treat, which is next week as well. I believe that there are lots of um, people that are getting involved in sharing a trunk, so please come along to that. And there's so much going on in the life of the church. We begin November. Um, where we celebrate our All Saints and All Souls service, the First Communion, on the 5th of November. And then we will join in on our picnic, and then we have our Veterans Day service. So, so much is going on in the life of the church, but it's all in the bulletin. Let's receive the offering. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasure. All that we have, God, we ask that you would use for the extension of your kingdom, that we would be transformed disciples for the transformation of the world. We offer you these, our gifts, that we receive today, that we receive throughout the week. We hold now, God, those whom we know and love that are suffering with cancer, with illness. We light this candle today, God, as a symbol of the courage of those who have struggled breast cancer. We thank you, God, for the miraculous way that people are able to find medication. We thank you, God, for the families that become the strength, for the children that inspire hope, for the partners that journey, for those doctors and nurses and medical fraternity that keep forging forward for new hope. We pray, God, that we would be a people that brings healing to those who suffer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this next song? I think we know this one. Here we go. Come the found. Come the found.
Church, you may be seated. Except the choir. <laughs> so, I have never done this on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to do something differently today. So I need to stand for this one. <laughs> Y'all having a good time in worship so far? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. So, Sopranos. so much to our worship team. Lorenzo is now going to lead us in our scripture and then we will hear from Tim. Good morning my brothers and Christus in Christ. Good How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. This morning's scripture is taken from Philippians chapter 1 reading from verse, verse 1 to 11. From Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all in Philippi who are God's people in Christ Jesus, along with your supervisors and servants, may the grace and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, be with you. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I am thankful for all of you every time I pray. And it's always a prayer full of joy. I am glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. I am sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are my partners in God's grace. 
both during my time in prison and in the defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with compassion of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer, that love might become ever, ever more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters and so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I pray that you will then be filled with fruit of righteousness, which comes from Jesus Christ, in order to give glory and praise to God. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Lorenzo, for sharing the scripture lesson this morning. And uh, I want to, as always, thank Pastor Jackie for the privilege of being in the pulpit this morning. Um, you know, it, this congregation, as many of you would know, has, has been in my heart because of a history that stretches back some 40 years. Um, but it's been a real joy to work with you off and on. And uh, it's, I tell you, it's great to be in worship. Um, I sense the movement of the spirit and something of the joy uh, that Paul talked about. Uh, in the Philippians letter, joy is one of the two significant words that appear over and over again. It's Paul's sunniest letter that he wrote to any of the churches uh, that he founded. And I have to tell you, you are gifted with a wonderful praise team in choir. Don't you think so? So tr trust me, I've been a lot of places, a lot of congregations, and uh, it is great. I love worshiping with you this morning. And, uh, and I want to give a shout out to the tech team this morning. So um, it is no easy thing. And for the second time, now that I'm back with you to preach, I walked in this morning and handed them a thumb drive and said, could you add some things to the slides this morning? And they didn't say nasty things to me. <laughs> like the tech team did in the church I last served. So, uh, so anyway, it's great. So this passage this morning, it, these are the opening verses of a letter that Paul, the founder of the church in Philippi, wrote to the congregation. We believe, many scholars believe, Paul was in prison at the time in Rome. And yet being behind prison bars did not stop him from continuing to pray for and communicate uh, with all the brothers and sisters in the churches um, that he had helped found. So I mentioned the first significant word in Philippians is joy. The second word is a little word in Greek called koinonia. Koinonia, that word appears like a thread throughout Paul's letter. Now koinonia is a word that we translate, our Bibles translate in different ways, um, to hold in common to share together, um, to have communion, to have participation in our lives together. But the word that, that I like the most is the one that is translated partnership. Paul said, I am grateful for our partnership. Our partnership in the gospel, you are my partners in God's grace. We are experiencing God's goodness together. And then a little later on in Philippians, he says, if there's any comfort in Christ, any consolation in Christ's love, any partnership in the Spirit. So over and over again, Paul is alluding to this sense that in Jesus Christ, we are bound together, woven together in ways that we can hardly imagine with each other. And this partnership has a lot to say about what it means to be church. And this partnership also has a lot to say about what it means for our giving together as a congregation. So I did get a heads up from Jackie that you're in the midst of your stewardship uh, series right now. And that did set me to thinking about what is the relationship between the kind of partnership that Paul is speaking of to the congregation and what it means 
to give as one tangible token of the sense of partnership that we share. So I want to try to help you see this morning how partnership and giving are connected together. We're in a partnership with each other because we share in God's generosity and God's goodness. We are partners in the good news that Jesus Christ bought, brought the salvation, which is forgiveness and healing. We are partners together in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit who not only pulls us together with a sense of unity, but gives us the power to live more deeply and share our lives with each other. So in the church, our giving is grounded in God's generosity and God's goodness. You all know this. It's grounded in God's grace, and that prompts from us our own gratitude for who God is and all that God has done to us. You know, Jesus talked about the, uh, the grace of God and did it with a number of vivid images. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus imagined him uh, at, at the bottom of this hillside like an amphitheater. People are sitting and scattered all about this hillside. And Jesus is teaching them and he's drawing illustrations from literally everything that people can see. Jesus talked about the birds of the air. He called them free and unfettered who live their lives without care because God provides for them in their short lives. And he says, you know, you count far more to God than birds. Amen? <laughs> and then he talks about fashion. You know, we worry about where we live, what clothes we're going to wear, and all that kind of thing. And, and Jesus says, don't focus on that with anxious thoughts. Look at the wild flowers that cover this field. He says they never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like that? And a couple of weeks ago, Candy and I were traveling up to North Carolina and back and, and various places all along the roadside. There were these fields of wildflowers, and they're just inexpressibly beautiful. And finally, Jesus goes on to say this. He says, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never seen by you and me, don't you think that God will attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to get you to do here, Jesus says, is to relax not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can focus on God's giving. Focus on God's giving. And so when we open our eyes, when we intentionally focus on what we are receiving from God, we are enabled to practice gratitude. Gratitude. And gratitude is a practice. It's something we can intentionally do. I know when Bishop Ken Carter was our bishop for a decade, he would constantly say to us, one of the things to do in your daily devotions is have a gratitude list. He said, I try every morning to start my morning and list three things that I'm thanking God for, gratefully for what God is giving to me or my family or those that I love. Start a gratitude list. And another thing that we can do that is a discipline of gratitude is give. Giving to the household of God is the practice of gratitude. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, this is a spoiler alert. I want to talk for a couple of minutes about tithing. So this is what I'd like you to do. Everybody take a deep breath. And now let it out slowly. Everybody take your shoulders and just kind of roll them like this and your neck like this and just kind of do what Jesus said, relax. I promise no people or animals will be harmed <laughs> in what I'm going to say next. Tithing is a biblical practice that we see most often in the Old Testament and very simply put, it's the practice of giving back a tenth of everything that God has given to us. That's, that's pretty simple, okay? Now, to say a few words about tithing, I will tell you this is me talking, not the Lord, okay? This is me. But I do think 
after many years of walking with Christ and studying the scriptures, that I might have something to say that would be helpful, and I want to say it now. As a personal discipline, tithing is something that Candy and I have practiced throughout our almost 48 years of marriage. We were really naive when we got married, and so we had this older couple that was mentoring us and what it meant to be married. And one of the things they said to us is, why don't you start out your marriage by tithing? And we believed them. <laughs> <laughs> and we did, and so we continue to do across these years. And I have to say, secondly, that tithing has been a very positive experience for us. It is a substantial commitment, but it has taught us two things. One is we cannot outgive God. And then secondly, for the most part, we have felt a real sense of freedom from anxiety and a preoccupation with finances. And both of those things have been very helpful for us. You know, the, our society has this drumbeat of, oh, you need this. You've got to have this. You, you want this. But when you live a life rooted in God's goodness and generosity, you find, I don't need that. I don't necessarily want that, but if I want that, I can go take my hand back. Now, the third thing I want to say is I do not believe tithing is a mandatory practice. Just like Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day who criticized the disciples and him for some of their violations of rules and regulations that surrounded the law of Moses, Jesus said, humanity is not made for the Sabbath, but what? Sabbath is made for humanity. So the same thing I would say to you is, um, you know, we are not made for tithing. Tithing is made for us. It is a discipline that if practiced will lead to generous giving and generous gratitude. Generous giving in and of itself without rules and regulations, I believe is a holy and healthy way to live our lives. Does that make sense? So this, our giving in and through the church is more like what in Israel was called a free will offering. If people were grateful to God and just wanted to express that, they would bring a free will or a voluntary offering, a sacrifice to the Lord. It, no requirement. It was just something that people were able to do, to be partners with God in thanks and generosity. Fifth thing is, Pastor Jackie, would you do this, please? Just do that. I don't believe all of our giving necessarily needs to go to the church. The church is important. In one of the churches I served many years ago, there was a couple in the church who uh, told me that they had something they called God's fund. That as a general rule, they set aside a tithe of everything uh, that was coming into them, of their resources, and that was a whole separate thing. And from God's fund, they would then give as the Spirit of God led them, including to the church in great measure. But there were other times, other places, other needs where they felt like God was directing them to give. When you're generous, don't worry about the percentage. Don't worry about the amount. Be grateful. Be generous. God will use it and God will bless you. So give out of gratitude. Practice consistent giving at increasing levels of generosity until you begin to experience the joy of giving. And I mean that seriously. Give consistently, give gratefully, give increasing levels until you experience the joy of giving. Then you'll know that you're in the sweet spot. You can enjoy your generosity and praise God even more. I hope that makes sense. Well, the second thing I want to say is in the church, now this is about the partnership, in the church, our hearts are centered in Jesus' humility, which prompts unity. Later on in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he talks about how Jesus humbled himself, did not think of himself as equal with God or 
or, or, or take advantage of that, but rather in fulfilling God's purposes by coming to earth, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, death on a cross. So for Paul, one of the hallmarks of the character of God expressed in Jesus is humility. And in the church, our humility will prompt unity. Let me explain this a little more. Um, in 1994, some of you may remember if you were here in South Florida, the Florida Marlins baseball franchise was awarded down in Miami. They started playing, I guess, what was Joe Robbie Stadium at that time. <clears throat> I'm a baseball fanatic. I was so excited. We were living in Miami Lakes, and, and so we go to baseball games. And, uh, and so in 1997, the Florida Marlins got into the playoffs they got all the way to the World Series. So I bought some tickets, and on a whim, I bought two tickets to the seventh game of the World Series. No, no idea if the series would go seven games or not. It's a best of four. But I said, why not? And so I went home, and I called my father on the phone, who had just moved to the villages. And I said, Dad, I said, I just bought two tickets to the World Series, and if the series goes to the seventh game, you're driving down here, and you're going with me. So guess what? It went to a seventh game. So my dad came down, we went to the stadium, we're there at the seventh and deciding game, and the, it's 67,000 people, frenzied fans in the stands. It, the atmosphere was electric. The game went back and forth, and then it went into extra innings. And in the bottom of the 11th inning, when Edgar Renteria hit a single and Craig Council crossed the plate, and the game was over, the Marlins won. And that's right. And my father and I, we are jumping up and down. We are hugging each other. We're high-fiving everybody all around us. I mean, we were just crazy, crazy. For We just must have stayed with everybody else for 20 minutes doing that. It's one of the best memories in my life. Three weeks later, my dad called me and said, you know, I just went with a cardiologist, and he said, uh, I need to have heart surgery. He said, like, right away. And I thought, oh, my gosh. You know, I could have <laughs> done my father in right then. But everything, everything went well. But what I learned afterwards about that season with the Marlins was this. Jim Leland, it was his first year as manager of the Florida Marlins then, and beginning in spring training, he brought his players together and he said, this is how it's going to be for us this year. 25 men, one heartbeat. That was their motto for the entire year. 25 men, one heartbeat, one purpose. Diverse personalities, diverse backgrounds, diverse personal priorities. But for us, it's 25 men, one heartbeat. And after the World Series was over, the center fielder for the Marlins, Devon White, said, it has been one team, one heartbeat all season. No egos in here. He said, if it hadn't been that way, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I want you to think about that. 25 men, one heartbeat. But what would it be like for a church to have one heartbeat? Diversity, difference, from all different ages and walks of life, but one heartbeat with each other. This is exactly what Paul is talking about, for what it means to be church. In the first seven verses of his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul uses the phrase, all of you, five times. All of you, Paul says, not just some of you. All of you, all of us are in this together. We have a partnership through the Holy Spirit to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, to celebrate God's generosity, and in turn, share that generosity with each other and with others in need. And then later on, he goes on to say this, about the source of the church's unity. He writes, therefore, if, and the if actually in Greek can also mean since, therefore, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, comfort from his love, common sharing or partnership in the spirit, 
If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So the Holy Spirit works within us to remind us and empower us to live together in unity. One purpose, one heartbeat. When things went south in my last appointment, I was pretty upset about it um, because you probably wouldn't be surprised when I thought to myself, they're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> and then two things happened. One was when I was praying, I heard the Lord say to me, get over yourself. Sure, get over yourself and get a larger heart. Get a larger heart. Second, second thing happened when I spoke to my leadership coach, who was also a spiritual director. I told her about the conflict that had broken out in the church. Her first words to me were these words, you must guard your heart against contempt. They were the most powerful words for me over the next two years. I had to get over myself. I had to ask God to give me a larger heart. I had to find the points of unity in the midst of our differences. And you know what? We did. We did. And God did something special with that. So in the church, we are going to disagree with each other about issues sometimes that are very important. You may not like everything that the pastor does. I know they do with you, Jackie. I do. But, uh, you know, you may not like everything the trustees do or this or that. Or of course. But the church is bigger than that. There's only one hill to die on, and somebody died on it for you and for me and for her and for him and for us and for them. See? So we must grow larger hearts and work together in unity. We are called to be partners together, our hearts joined with the heart of Jesus. And so we do it with gratitude, with humility, always, always seeking that unity of purpose and sense of love that binds us together. Because why? Because the church is the hope of the world, called to become God's house of hospitality and healing. Last weekend, Candy and I went to Orlando. We were invited by the church that we grew up in to celebrate a 50th reunion of the youth and young adult choirs that were in that church. And there were about 30 of us that showed up. And uh, it was hilarious. You know, if, if you thought you could sing when you were 17, you know, now, <clears throat> now that you're 68, it was like, uh, uh, but, you know, we're rehearsing these songs we used to sing, getting ready to share them in worship. But we took a break during rehearsal Saturday afternoon, just sat down on the, on the steps up here, like on the platform, and just the invitation was, who would like to share what being in this youth choir or being a part of this church has meant to you in your life? And then the sharing began. One woman shared how her mother had died while she was still in high school and how she was just lost and grieving. And her family, frankly, she said, was not much help to her. And she found her way. She was invited by a peer to come at our, to our church and to participate, to be in the choir, to be part of youth fellowship and worship. And she said, I found here a safe place a godly place, and I gave my life to Jesus. In our own family, for Candy and, and her siblings, the church became a place to grieve and heal when their mother died over 50 years ago from breast cancer. There was a woman at our weekend helping to organize the weekend who just turned 80 years old. 50 years ago, she left her small hometown after a very painful experience in her life. She said, I ran away. 
and moved to Orlando. And she happened to walk into our home church the Sunday that the youth choir was singing. And she said, the song that you were singing, she said, it touched my heart in such a deep way at that critical moment that in that worship service, I rededicated my life to Christ. And I found a new beginning at that moment. And here she was 50 years later. She actually wound up singing with us in the choir that weekend. It was such, such a joy. This is what the Lord can do for us and in us and among us today and now if we will gather our hearts around that beating heart of Jesus Christ and seek unity together in the spirit, a unity of purpose, a unity of gratitude, a unity of love. In this broken and, as we know, brutish world we're living in today, as a church, we can become what in Judaism is called tikkun olam, repairs of the world, repairs of the world. Let's pray together. Gracious, giving God, we give you thanks just to be in this house of worship this morning. It's a real blessing. It's a privilege to be surrounded by great music, the beauty of the space, to hear one another's voices, to sing praises to you, and to lift ourselves and others in prayer. We give you thanks. Lord, we know we're never going to see things the same way, but we can love each other the same way. So, Lord, this morning I pray, enlarge the hearts of everyone who is here this morning. Make us more generous, more forgiving, committed to healing, committed to sharing the love of Christ with each other, and to never, ever stop doing that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand to our feet. If you can, and we'll let the praise and the glory of God rise up in this place. Amen. Amen.
much Pastor Tim and Candy for joining us, for giving us your great wisdom. Can you please bless us with a benediction? Friends, please join us afterwards for lots of eats in the mission building. And don't forget, go past the eats here, buy them so we don't have to take anything home. And, in, and um, we'll also look forward to just buying a couple of things from the craft ladies. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. It's really been a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Receive this blessing, if you would please. Now may the one who's able to keep you from falling, able to lift you up, able to pride you with every good thing through Jesus Christ. To God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be all praise and glory. Amen. 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 Ooh, thanks, Tim. Don't forget, 3 o'clock, if you're not able to join us, we do have our charge conference at Christchurch. Remember us in prayer, please, at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. Hello, Mr. Real good.